Welcome to this episode of Pocket Pearls. My name is Gamar Vitar. I'm one of the residents at Christiana, and I'm here with Dr. Jane, one of our maternal fetal medicine physicians. Today we're here to talk about the prolonged study. Dr. Jane, can you tell me a little bit about what this study is about? Okay, so the prolonged study stands for 17P to prevent recurrent preterm birth in singleton gestations. Um, the study was really important because we've been waiting for a while to see the outcome or the efficacy of 17P in women with a history of prior preterm birth. Since the majority of our um, recommendations and sort of clinical guidance and counseling has all been based on a single study done um, in 2003, which is the MACE trial. So this was a very anticipated study, and I think a lot of SMFM membership and MFM physicians were looking forward to seeing the results of this study. Okay, and I imagine that the MACE trial has supported that 17 OHP helps in prevention of preterm birth. Exactly. The MACE trial was probably one of the most significant trials in changing how we managed preterm birth. So in general, whenever we see a woman with a history of prior preterm birth, there's always four options that we go through with them about prevention of a recurrent preterm birth. Uh, one would be progesterone of some sort, and there's two formulations of progesterone, vaginal progesterone and intramuscular or subcutaneous 17-OHP. Um, we talk about cerclage. In recent years, some of us have started talking about the pessary. Um, and then we just talk about expectant management, and perhaps that if they've only had one preterm birth, or depending on the gestational age of the prior preterm birth, their risk of recurrence is sufficiently low that maybe we're only going to do cervical length screening, or we're not going to do anything. But there's just a lot of counseling that goes into it um, when we're trying to decide what the best um, plan of action is for a patient. Okay, and so Prolong was a randomized control trial, multi-center across many countries. What kind of findings did it have? So the reason why Prolong stirred up so much commotion, and I'm sure anyone who's been on social media platforms recently, um, who's followed the news, I understand there was an AMA alert about it, is that it showed very discrepant results from the MEES, tri from the MEES trial. And so if you think about it, the MEES trial was published in 2003, it is now 2019. So for 16 years, we have managed preterm birth this way, where um, SMFM has gone so far in it to say that the recommended um, treatment options for a woman with a prior history of preterm birth with a delivery prior to 37 weeks and a current singleton should be offered 17P. And we've done this for so long. So the issue is now you have this trial that is you know, quite impressive, like you said, multi-center, randomized, double-blind control, all the things we would look for and yet it found no benefit. And that was shocking, because I think all of us were expecting that it would definitely, probably robustly support the MIS trial. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't it? Right. So now, it, now the commotion or the interest on social media is the dissection of the trial. So what makes it different, or what, why could it be different? Why would the results be so discrepant? Is there something going on with um, the patient demographics? Sure. Is there something going on with the enrollment? Um, um, was the statistical analysis not correct? But the FDA's job is to take that information and make a decision about the safety of a medication, and especially in pregnancy, the safety of a medication in pregnancy. And so that has been out on social media uh, the last week or so, um, and culminated with the FDA vote that happened on Tuesday. Yeah, and my understanding of 17 HP is that there are really no adverse side effects known in pregnancy. The few studies that have evaluated it have shown that there's um, no significant harm to continuing using it. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, it's not entirely benign. So um, there have been some case reports, some people have documented mixed results about whether it increases the risk for gestational diabetes or not. In certain populations, it has been shown to increase the risk. In other studies, it has never been shown to increase risk. Um, I believe the package insert itself also talks about a slightly increased risk for miscarriage and um, loss in the first and early second trimesters, and then it also talks about it risk for um, venous thromboembolism. Again, never fully borne out in you know in the randomized control trial, and they didn't necessarily see those risks in the MEES trial, but it was not studied, so that has always been an argument. Um, now, that wasn't the primary focus of Prolonged either. It wasn't to look at adverse effects right. of seventeen P. It was look it was looking to see if seventeen P could prevent preterm birth or reduce the risk of recurrence of preterm birth. So again, not a study designed to really look at adverse effects of seventeen P. But in the 17, 16, 17 years people have been using this and even prior to two thousand and three. So let's say in the last twenty years that we've given progesterone to women in some form, oral, 
intramuscular, sub-Q, vaginal. I mean, we've used progesterone in women's healthcare for years and years and years. There's, there hasn't really been clear adverse side effects. So yes, okay. in general, probably it's a very safe drug, but you know, nothing is entirely 100% safe in pregnancy. Sure. So it is reasonable, especially when the FDA is making rules for use in pregnancy that they should be cautious and evaluate all the data. Sure. Um, and you briefly touched on the difference in possibly the patient demographics or the populations in both the MACE trial and the prolonged trial. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, I think um, the MACE trial, the rate of recurrent preterm birth, women who've had two or more prior preterm deliveries was well over 50% that they would have a recurrent third delivery. Um, the recurrence rate for preterm birth in the prolonged study was much lower. It was 11%. So people right away were like, well, that's unusual. Um, and then the demographics was one of the big um, concerns, mostly relating to race characteristics, um, with the MEST trial being predominantly African American and this new prolonged trial being predominantly Caucasian. And then there were differences in demographics with smoking. Mm -hmm. um, and any of you who have covered um, PIP clinic with Dr. Rustaller know that she recommends, you know, tobacco cessation for anybody with a history of prior preterm birth because we feel like that could be an additive risk factor. So it's hard to compare the two studies like that um, because they're not exactly the same population. And that's kind of when people are dissecting it, that is one of the arguments, you know, could it be that 17P in certain patient populations, very specific demographics, could this be an effective therapy? We just aren't, we don't know who that patient population is. And what are those patient characteristics that d would determine someone to be a good candidate for 17P versus a bad candidate or an ineffective, um, an ineffective therapy in that candidate? And are SMFM and ACOG kind of on board with um, taking each patient case by case and providing individualized care, or are they uh, hopeful to stop using 17HP? Yeah, I think um, so. We've seen two, three, well, two statements essentially um, come out, one from the ACOG and so one from the college and then one from the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. Um, I think ACOG sort of seemed to imply it's okay if you want to keep giving 17P. Um, I thought the society, the SMFM's uh, opinion was a little bit more nuanced where they sort of said, look, you should counsel, it should be a case by case, it should be very individualized, you certainly should counsel the patient about all of their options. So I think for most of us, it's probably not going to change our counseling that much. Okay. I am still going to counsel, there are four methods of preterm birth prevention, progesterone in two forms, so that's two of them, mm -hmm. surplage and pestery. Um, the only difference might be that when talking about I am progesterone, I think I will probably mention two trials. Like sure. normally I say, we're going to do this based on the MIS trial published in 2003, and we're going to follow that protocol. You're going to get 17P starting at 16 weeks. It's going to go to 36. We're going to follow your cervix. You'll get a surclage if these things happen. I think now one thing that I might change would be explaining to patients a little bit more in depth. So we had this one study in 2003. We have done it this way for the last 16 years. We have this new study, different patient population. There were different patient demographics. It shows maybe there isn't a benefit. So here's why I think maybe you would be a good candidate. For example, maybe I would look at their race or ethnicity. Maybe I would look at the number of preterm births they had. Uh, maybe I would look to see whether they had 17 P before, like right, like right. in a prior right. with a prior, yeah, and if it was effective for them, if they felt that they wanted it again. Um, a lot of it comes down to patient counseling because there's a lot of patients that we offer all these things and they're just like, no, sure. I don't want needles or I don't want to take any medicine in pregnancy. So I think it's good to go through everything with them. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily going to change. Right now it's not going to change completely the way I practice. The issue will be if the FDA removes it completely from the oh, market. Okay. Then I think you do have a different counseling, you do have to take that into consideration because now you're not prescribing an FDA medication, FDA approved medication. You're prescribing an off-label use for 17P, which requires them to get it from a compounding pharmacy. Financial. There's financial because it won't be covered by their insurance. So it, it may limit some patients are going to be able to get it. Some patients may not. Um, you don't necessarily know one of the complaints everybody has made over the years is, you know, the... Um, the compliance of compounding pharmacies with the amount of progesterone and 
Um, is it exactly the same formulation as McKenna? So can it be considered as effective? Um, I know even with the change from intramuscular to subcutaneous, some of us had had have had concerns. So even though the company has said that the formulation that's used in sub-Q is very similar to IM and was proven to have the same level or bioavailability, those studies were done in postmenopausal women. They weren't done in active pregnant patients looking at the pharmacokinetics. So more, we need to do more data. There are lots of studies out there. A lot of people are looking at it. Um, Dr. Kretis has a whole lab where he's looking at it. Um, Rupsa Bolig, who's one of our Jefferson fellows, has done a lot of um, research looking at pharmacokinetics or um, bioavailability of 17P. So I think there are researchers who are interested, and that would be the real, that would be what's most interesting. So that's how much, yeah. what formulation, what level, and then that, I think, is how you could use it to titrate or decide if your patient is getting the right amount. Okay. The other thing that I think that needs to come out that would be great is that um, a few years ago, I believe, I thought it was... Um, Dr. Manick had a study where she looked at the gene loci and looked to see whether people responded to 17P or not. It's been a few years since I've read this, but that might be another to way really to look at target yes. the right patient population. Yes, like they've done in cancer genetics, right? right? So now they do genetic testing and they right. see whether your specific cancer is going to respond to this particular drug. They've done it with Coumadin. You know, should we be doing that? Maybe that's what we're missing. Right. Maybe there's some... Maybe it's not about gene. race or smoking, but yeah. something that... something else. There's some sort of gene, um, genetic component that we are missing, and that's who needs to get 17P. Okay. So I think the prolonged study just raised... I think this all just raises a lot of questions sure. and not a lot of answers. Mm -hmm. In general, most people are not going to change their day-to-day -day counseling because there isn't great... There isn't convincing enough data, or I think there's enough arguments. There's problems with both studies. So we're still left in the end with four options for treatment. Right. right. Yeah. So take home point is to adjust our counseling. Mm -hmm. um, stay tuned for more information in terms of FDA approval or lack of approval for 17 OHP um, and to really ha continue informed decision making with yeah. our patients. I think so. And I think the, um, the SMFM has really been on top of it. They issued their statement early in the week on Monday, and then the, they really encouraged all the membership, as many mm -hmm. membership as possible, to attend the FDA meeting because they were taking public commentary. So I think a lot of representatives went down, voiced their, you know, you get a room of MFMs, everybody's going to have a different Absolutely. opinion. So I think a lot of people went, voiced their opinions about it. And then I think they issued a second statement sort of reiterating that, you need to counsel your patient. Like, yes, we're aware of this. We're not going to put out some sort of clinical guidance saying don't give it. Just, you know, counsel your patients about the trial. See which, consider their patient demographics. Consider um, shared decision-making with them. See what they want to do. And I think that's kind of what ACOG is heading towards yeah. as well. So. Okay. Well, yeah. great. Thank okay. you, Dr. You're G. welcome.